Welcome to Discoveries in American Art magazine. And uh, we're on virtual magazine online. Um, we're so happy that um, Tony Fusco has invited us back again for this year's Boston Design Week. This time he really wanted to share with you um, some insider information, at least give you a practical perspective from some of the members of our curatorial board as to what makes them make a decision in regard to quality and significance of an artist's works. And uh, as with last year, I'm joined with my colleague, uh, Robert Berry uh, of Robert Berry Gallery in New York. And um, Robert and I have uh, you know, interviewed uh, and some of our own um, board members. And we're so we're gonna be sharing that feedback with you right away. So no further ado. So Robert, I would really like to start with an artist that you have um, met a few years ago and that you're excited about. Um, who is the you know, artist that you've discovered and what was it about this artist's works that immediately struck you? Um, why did you feel they're truly innovative before you even got to know anything about the artist? Well, first, Peter, I just want to say thank you so much for having this conversation with me today. And Tony and the Boston design team, thank you so much for um, letting us do this panel discussion today. It's um, going to be very, very fun, very exciting, and it's going to be, it's going to be great. So, Peter, um, the artist that I want to talk about today um, is an artist by the name of David Kastner. And I first met David um, around 2008 when I was the director of a gallery called Gallery Icosahedron that was down in Tribeca and eventually moved to Chelsea. And the owner of the gallery, um, the late Dahlia Chaco, was absolutely mesmerized by David's work. And before he even said two words, um, she immediately offered him a show. And wow. after um, getting to speak with him a little bit um, over the course of a couple months planning for the show, um, I immediately bonded um, over art history, politics, philosophy, and it was ultimately, David was an artist artist, where it was one of those artists who all the painters know, all the sculptors know who he is, but the critics, um, the press, not all of those um, sides of the art business and the art world really understood who he was and what he was trying to do. And ultimately, Peter, um, I think that David was brilliant and his work was far ahead of its time. When other artists were still doing zombie formalism at that time, David was rediscovering his love for conceptual art, color theory. And at that time, I actually put him in a two-man show with um, Joseph Boys, who David was a huge fan of. And that was more in the line of what David was thinking, more of a conceptual artist who was using painting than a painter who was painting. I see. One of, Robert, one of the things I've noticed about Castor's works is that, um, besides them being really compelling, they're, they're quite different in, 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 in many ways uh, from each other, almost like he was going through different experimental phases. And why do, you, why do you think that he never really achieved the level of recognition that you feel that he deserves? Or, you know, now that you're uh, bringing him back, representing him, um, why did it take so long, do you think? Well, ultimately, um, David never really played the art gallery game. And I guess one of the funniest stories that David told me early on is that um, a very famous art dealer um, loved his work, um, was trying to give him a show, um, but she was also interested in him personally. And David, of course, turned her down as he wasn't really interested in pursuing that kind of relationship. And a lot of the galleries um, on the block um, refused to speak with him, refused to look at his work. And it was simple that he turned down a gallerist from making a pass at him. And that oxidized <laughs> him to a lot of the New York gallery scene. Wow. And besides the personal parts of it, um, his work was always more conceptual. And it seemed to be that a lot of people didn't always understand that. Um, but the reason I selected David Kastner for our discussion today is that it was always more work than thought that went into it. It's some artists um, are all conceptual and no hard work. Some artists are just doing painting, just working and working and working and not thinking. Where it's David took his background from the Midwest growing up on a farm and understanding a hard day's work 
he knew that he would have to put that hard work into his paintings where half the work comes by thinking about the work and then the other half of it comes spending hundreds of hours in the studio actually making it. So it seems to be that throughout his career, David was always more interested in spending time in the studio um, slaving over things than going out and playing the system. Um, he had a couple big um, gallery shows. He was invited to the Grand Prix at Monte Carlo. He had a big show at the um, Tokyo Museum early on, the Tokyo Central Museum. And it would seem to be that ultimately he wanted to make work and was less, less inclined to play the game, as we would say on the inside. I see. So now with you um, being his uh, champion, advocating his work and getting it out there, and I understand you're going to have an exhibition of his works. Um, I guess sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, reaching the right people and getting out to influencers in the market to get the attention of museum curators so that you can um, uh, show so they can see for themselves why it matters, especially coupled with things that have to be explained from the conceptual point of view, and then it clicks in people's minds and say, oh my gosh, this really is amazing. Absolutely, absolutely. And then as, um, as we know, and part of the big part of discoveries in American art, a lot of that narrative is that artists disappear for one reason or another, and often the artist not really wanting to play with galleries, not really being terribly interested in selling their work, there is always another story at hand. And what really kind of changed the tide for David is that it's been the gallerists who believed in him, like myself, who are really pushing him and getting him to make the best painting he's ever made. So I've been a fan and supporter of his work for since 2008, you know, almost 13 years now. And it's David is always doing the best thing he's ever done. And his um, new, the new naive, um, figurative paintings he's doing um, came from some problems he's had. Um, he had some health problems a few years ago. He's had arthritis and surgery in his hands, his elbows, his shoulders. And now these darker subjects are coming out. And this really um, comes a long way from the earlier wood sculptures that he was doing that were more ephemeral, um, more ribbon-like, floating through space, um, definitely different than his experiments with light. And it's now that David is kind of on the same page where it's what he's doing today is more in line with the current style at the time. Okay, so it's interesting because there are people who purchase his works way back when you first saw him, and they're gonna be very happy to see that, uh, that you're um, championing his works now. Are, do any happen to be in any museum collections? Um, yes, actually. Um, there's the Midwest um, Museum of American Art in Indiana who has a very large early sculpture. And there's a few, several other works and some scattered collections across the US, some institutions. Um, in the late 80s and early 90s, um, he had a lot of decent galleries in Europe and has a sizable collector base over there now. Great. So going forward, you see a path for uh, even greater recognition being uh, realized for him? Absolutely, yes. Um, it's David is unique in his work that everyone who's seen his work has always received it very positively. Um, they see the quality that goes into it, the amount of time that goes into each work, and it's one of those pieces you can immediately see that the an artist invested a lot of time into the minor details, where um, some collectors might not see that, but a gallerist who is looking for works and looking for artists to represent is going to notice those um, minute details that other people might overlook. And David is one of those artists who, if the back of the painting doesn't look as great as the front of the painting or the bottom of the sculpture isn't as perfect, he'll spend another three weeks in the studio making that work perfect before he leaves it and before he signs it. Wow, wow. Well, we're certainly glad that you have recognized all these uh, details and uh, attention that uh, focus that he's put on really refining his works and I'm sure he'll 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 get there with you. I sure hope so Peter. I sure hope so. Next I'm, I'm really happy to introduce another of our uh, members of our curatorial board Gregory de la Haba. Gregory is uh, an art critic, art historian, also an artist uh, with some extraordinary um, uh, carved uh, surfboards that are totemic in nature 
And uh, he's, he's also a, a brilliant realist figurative painter. So go figure, there's a dichotomy right there. But um, here today, uh, he's speaking about an artist who uh, he's been following for many years now and scratching his head, trying to figure out why hasn't this very important woman not achieved her due recognition when she was up there uh, with um, uh, some of the leading lights you know, of her day in the 70s, the 80s, and uh, a brilliant painter, and that's Judy Rifka. So Gregory, uh, we're thrilled to have you here with us today and um, uh, looking forward to you telling us a little more about how you discovered uh, Judy Rifka and why she stood out in your mind right away. Gregory, it's great having you here with us today uh, oh, because you are both an artist as well as an art historian, and you've written a lot of essays. And uh, a, besides exhibiting your own work all over, you're exhibiting the works of others. So yes. your artist who you've discovered, tell us about her and how that happened. Sure. Judy Rifka was the quintessential art star in the 70s and 80s in the New York downtown scene. And since that was before my time, I never heard of her. And I met her about 14 years ago when I was hosting quite a few events on the Lower East Side in the East Village. And this lady always showed up, always said hello, was always polite and courteous. And um, she always invited me to her studio. And finally, one day I took her up on it. And when I walked into her space, I was like, who are you? Uh, I couldn't believe what I saw. And I just saw piles of paintings and sculptures. And when she started to tell me her history, I made her a promise then and there that I was gonna do something for her. And uh, that I, I was gonna resurrect her career because when her blue chip gallery, Brooke Alexander closed in 1993, she just kind of faded out of the scene. No other big gallery picked her up. Uh, she went about her life. Um, you know, she taught at the new school and she kept painting. Um, her life mimics very closely to that of Lee Bontecu, where, you know, great early success early on. And then she had, um, excuse me, Peter. And then she had, uh, you know, children. She raised her children, then she taught, and then one day the world woke up and realized who Lee Bontecu really was again. And I, uh, that's gonna happen with Judy Rifka. And we're mounting a major show of hers in Germany, in Munich, uh, 40 minutes outside of Munich in a beautiful picturesque town co called Murnau am Staffelsee. Um, it's where- When, when is Kinsky. that? When's that show gonna be? It opens up uh, September 24th. And, okay. Uh, so you've gone, you've gone on a path with her for a long time, but going back to when you first met her, just what was it that immediately struck you about the work? Because you didn't know about her past. You just saw the work. What was it? Um, you know, when you see so much of one thing in one place, you kind of feel the energy. Um, you, you feel the sincerity, the genuineness. And I was able to feel just from glancing in her studio, which was a rather large studio, um, this unique voice. And Judy's work, especially early on her most famous single shapes that everybody wrote about in the 70s and early 80s, um, had to do with dance and, um, and, and movement within the picture frame. Um, she actually painted on plywood and plywood for Judy was reminiscent of the dance floor uh, that she was used to, accustomed to dancing on. Wow, so, so she did have a major gallery, Brooke Alexander, I remember that yes. gallery. And, and, and um, she sold like hotcakes. Well, and what, so when the gallery closed, was she the type who wasn't going to go banging on gallery doors, trying to get new representation or how did it just sort of, she drift away? You know, let's not forget that after Francis Bacon died, there was question about his legacy as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, 
you know, same thing with uh, Warhol and whatnot. It's just, it's like, you know, when you don't have anybody pushing you and then another whole kind of art scene emerges and that's when the, the, the YBA started to appear on the scene in the, in, in the early and mid nineties. Um, I just, I just think that, um, you know, sometimes things don't happen the way you, uh, you wish them to happen. Right. So now the, uh, the art culture is revisiting a couple things. Number one, yep. Uh, the the heirs of uh, abstract expressionism, and who's who continuing to paint that way, but also uh, a spotlight on uh, women mm -hmm. and minorities, of, of course, as well, uh, coming to uh, everyone's attention. So uh, your your timing uh, for bringing her this long overdue recognition because she's really a rediscovery. She was like a rock star. She, who just sort of dropped movie. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was in two Whitney Biennials. She was in Documenta. Uh, it was curated by the legendary German curator Klaus Hanoff. Um, she was in the Times Square show. Um, you know, she was in the inaugural exhibition at PS1. And everybody who wrote about Judy Rifka, beginning with uh, Jeremy Gilbert Roth, who wrote an art forum in 1974, that Judy Rifka's paintings dominated the show. And he said that they were the most original uh, formulations of pictures. Um, what was it that he said? Um, formulation of paintings identity that he had seen in a long time. Um, then further on in 1981, uh, Rene Ricard, who was a very dear friend of Judy's for his entire life, uh, wrote the off-sided essay, The Radiant Child. And that was the first critical essay of Basquiat's work. But it was also about Keith Haring and Judy Rifka. And, um, you know, even Rene Ricard recognized that everybody who saw Judy Rifka's paintings, these single shapes, recognized their influence. And then my favorite, of course, fast forward until uh, 2007, when Judy Rifka's ex-husband, David Reed, curated a show at Gagosian called... Um, High Times, Hard Times, uh, paintings from 1967 to um, 1975. Roberta Smith wrote of the brave, if deficient show. Let me quote. Uh -huh. <laughs> In other instances, the selected works are minor, as derivative now as they were then. Or the ideas are so literal or reduced that the artist couldn't go anywhere with them. Some inclusions seem almost ludicrous, given rather certain obvious absences of Judy Rifka, whose efforts were among the most closely watched developments of the early 1970s. So everybody remembers Judy Rifka. Everybody uh, wrote about Judy Rifka glowingly back when she was showing in the 70s and 80s. And here's the kicker, Peter. She's still painting. And myself, my collectors, my close artist colleagues, we all feel that the paintings that Judy Rifka are doing now are some of her best work to date. So, so with this exhibition in Germany, um, how, did that, how did that come about? And do you think that this show will, uh, maybe it takes being in Germany to get the attention of people and uh, collectors in America and what, what do you see as the next yep. steps for her future? Mark my words, this is going to be a game changer show. Um, Judy Rifka had many shows in Germany over the years. And uh, she has a huge loyal fan base in Germany. Um, she's in 26 museums around the world. And for whatever reason, Peter, you know, she just kind of got pushed to the side. But... I tell you, there's a concerted effort right now amongst a lot of people that are going to change things. When you walk into an artist studio and you can feel the energy, uh, you can feel that unique voice. It's a special, beautiful thing. And I hunger for that. You know, I, I look forward to meeting new artists. And uh, Judy is hands down one of my favorite. And, and even like her wallpaper series that she showed at the Whitney Biennial in 1983, they look as fresh and beautiful today as they did, you know, 30, 40 years ago. 
Um, so the show opens up on the 24th of September in the town that inspired Wassily Kadinsky. It's called Mernau M. Stafelzy. Ah. It's a beautiful, picturesque artist village in the foothills of the Bavarian Alps. And the gallery that's showcasing her work is called Pulpo Gallery. Okay, good, good. Yes. Judy was a student of uh, Ron Gorchov, the late Ron Gorchov in, in, the, in the mid 60s. And uh, she came out of that period and in the early 70s, and she was also a dancer. Uh, movement and dance was a big influence on her life. Um, and so she wanted to create these, these images that were not only flat, but that had movement. And the movement is in these, these magnificent brush strokes um, with this handmade painter. And it's a layering of, of paint. And she allows that layering and the movement of the paint to create almost her dance within this four by four picture frame. Um, you know, when you see these things, you feel that at first that they're collage because of how they're built up layer upon layer, but it, it's, it's, it's pure paint, just pure layering of paint. And uh, they, they look as fresh today as they did when she did them in the 70s. Wow, great. So the exhibition will show uh, uh, the whole range of yeah. her work. It's, it's going to be a retrospective? Yeah, without doubt. We're going to have pictures from every period. Um, she did canvas on canvas works in the, eight, in the 90s. Um, in the 80s, she did the uh, wallpaper series that the Whitney Biennial selected. Um, we're going to have some of her paintings that she showed at the Mud Club, that Keith Haring uh, curated at the Mud Club. and. Um, then we'll also have her single shapes. Oh, great. Yeah, and and for the exhibition, for the exhibition, I'm sure there'll be a, a catalog that people might want to have. So yeah. we'll connect you with those uh, inquiries and we invite, invite people to contact us because we will connect you with, uh, with Greg, so. Great. And one more thing, Peter, when I was doing my research for Judy, um, I came across this photographer, his name is Tom Warren. Next, I'd like to introduce Robert C. Morgan, a uh, professor who would, teaches uh, at uh, Pratt now. Uh, he's actually a professor emeritus. He's the author of more than 2,000 essays, at least a dozen books uh, on contemporary art. And um, what's unusual is that Robert is also an artist. He's always been an artist since uh, receiving his master's in 1975. And he sort of fell into being an art historian and enjoyed it so much. He continued this double life. I call it uh, double lives um, uh, when you really very actively pursuing both. So uh, Robert is here today, uh, not speaking about other artists so much as really wanting to share with you his own work. So it'd be really kind of interesting for everyone to see, I think, what would it be like if an uh, art historian could also paint? And so that's one of the fun things about taking a look at Robert's works. Um, here you're looking at a painting that is um, uh, from a series. They're all 22 inches square. They're all in acrylic with metallic pigments. All of the pigments are earth pigments. There are no primary colors of red, yellow, blue. Um, uh, they're, they're purely uh, natural earth pigments, which is all part of his um, approach and his philosophy uh, to painting. And um, Robert, we're happy to have you discuss uh, one of your paintings from this series um, uh, today. The, the, the point is, Robert, really for 50 years, yeah. your art has lived in parallel with your writing. Yes, oh, that's great. That's great. So on the one hand, your paintings have been shown in, in many solo and group exhibitions. And on the other hand, you've written more than 2,000 essays, over that's a dozen true, books. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, plus you've curated more than 70 exhibitions internationally. So uh, in short, really, you are a, a rare bird. So ha have you always uh, felt that you've been leading a double life? Uh, you know that I, I was 
happy for that question because um, uh, I have never felt that, but other people feel it all the time. And it gets on my nerves <laughs> because you know they you know they they come to me and say, oh, you're an artist. I thought you were an art critic. Oh, you were you, you're an art critic. I thought you were a curator. And to me, this makes no sense. You know, uh, uh, with uh, one of the more recent um, series of paintings that I've been doing, which I call Logia. Uh, Logia, by the way, is the uh, the shadow that you see from the arches uh, from uh, Renaissance art. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, if you're in that uh, shadowy zone between the arches and the facade, uh, you have the loggia. And uh, the reason I call those paintings loggia is because you have to have uh, a very indirect light uh, because I'm using metallic paints as well as uh, earth colors. I only use one chromatic color and that's uh, ultramarine blue, okay? And ultramarine blue, is, it's never really obvious because it's always mixed in with the other earth colors. Uh, but the point is, uh, you know, I'm not using, you know, any primaries, any secondaries, any of that. Uh, earth color, metallic color, and ultramarine, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the work, uh, there's a lot of mixing of the paints, okay? Uh, but uh, these are the colors that I use. I, I use red oxide. I don't use cadmium at all, never, okay? I use red oxide, which is an earth color. It's, it's from the earth, okay? So, and uh, I use uh, burnt umber, okay? Uh, I, uh, I, I, I use colors that I feel are, well, connected to me in some way, you know, that, you know, when I'm writing about art, I try and write about things that I don't do. I mean, for example, there are some artists who will only want to write about things that they do. I do exactly the opposite. Actually, um, thank you so much, Robert. Um, that was very fascinating. Um, I actually have known Robert for about the same length I've known you, Peter. Um, I met him at Gallery Richard back in 2012, 2011, and I first met him as an art critic, um, but I was even more fascinated by when I discovered that he was also a painter a couple years later, and I first saw his work at a gallery up in Chelsea on 26th Street, I believe. Terrific. Well, I guess the moral of the story is here uh, that if you, if you balance your time, you really can lead a double life and do it well, because uh, Robert has made uh, a number of discoveries of his own, both in uh, Asia and in America. And um, so we're happy to have this little different perspective on uh, these sessions today. Robert's one of the, the only masters who has mastered the dual life of being an artist and a critic and has done quite successful in both categories. Yeah. Now our next, um, our next member of our curatorial board is Anthony Hayden Guest. And, um, you all may uh, have read some of his uh, pointed uh, uh, sardonic wit, his writings in uh, various uh, uh, magazines from Vogue to the International Art Newspaper um, uh, that used to crack me up every time that I read them. But he, he has, again, a, little, a different approach to um, really uh, assessing artists, sort of... Um, uh, and in an innocent eye test, really, because he does not profess to be an art historian per se, um, but he is definitely a social critic, and he understands uh, and has written extensively about the art world, so he knows what people want and what they're looking for, but he also knows the real deal when he sees it. And the artist that he's speaking about is Linus Caraggio, whose name you might not know, but you really should. And Anthony, tell us about um, uh, Linus and how you met him and why his work stands out in your mind. So I'm pleased to introduce Anthony Hayden Guest, who has written several books on the art world. And many of the characters in those books have been bitten by his sardonic wit. He says today that art fairs are the new disco but he's on our curatorial board because he also says that discoveries and rediscoveries such as ours indicate that, and this is his quote, 
the pantheon of great contemporary artists is like the Arctic ice shelves melting. And uh, Anthony, we're looking forward to hearing from you about the artist who you have discovered and uh, how that happened and what struck you about his works. Okay, well, I certainly didn't discover Linus Baraggio. Um, he's well known, but I, I think he's insufficiently well known and it's hard to, in a way to bring his work into focus because it's so various. He's, he's, um, he does not have a signature of style. He's a compulsive art maker. And um, when I first realized that he was quite something, I went around, I think I went around to interview him and I had my laptop with me and I kind of went out of the room for something. I came back and the laptop had been turned into, a, into an artwork. It had been Rivingtonized, which is to reference the Rivington School. Uh, everything uh, around Linus tends to get turned into an artwork. He's a compulsive art maker. Tell us about his, you know, why do you think with the group that he ran with um, everyone from, you know, Basquiat to Keith Haring and the, you know, he was, he was running and he was, he was really one of the pioneers with those guys. So why do you think that he never really achieved the recognition, at least the speed uh, uh, track that they were on, uh, that he that he really deserved? Why did it take so long? Well, he was on a slightly, he was, he was on the same track in a way as Ken Hiratsuka, you know, who, who carved wonderful pieces into the sidewalks. He's very much committed to working on the, on the street. He invented 3D graffiti, he took graffiti out and he's a welder. If there's only one central thing in his work, it's welding. And he'd weld these magnificent pieces to street signs and things like that. And he has amazing ambitions. He'd, he'd, he'd talk of welding together a row of motor cars or six aeroplanes. <laughs> and he'd sometimes do that too. Wow. Wow. So, um, what's happening now to change the tide for your, for Caraggio and to, to bring him the recognition uh, that he I really think he's deserved. produced a very substantial body of work and a very various body of work. And um, I think his time has really come. Do you know, are, are any of his works, where, where can they be seen today? Are any in museums, for example, or uh, galleries where they can be seen? Um, I, right now, I mean, he's, he's in collections, he's in museums, and, um, I, I, and he's been shown in some terrific galleries. I... So going forward, you see a path for him gradually getting, you know, greater recognition and being placed, especially with, historically, is what you saw, you know, with him, uh, you responded to viscerally seems to be the authenticity of his work as it was, uh, you know, others were creating graffiti uh, on the on the walls. And here he was being a, a, a sculptor graffiti artist. So that's absolutely. And he, he founded the Rivington School, which which created sculpture gardens and um, mm -hmm. so forth all, all over the Lower East Side. Um, he's very post most modernist. You know, the great abexes, mostly they had a signature style. They'd forge ahead until they'd exhausted something, they'd move on to something else. But it's always been very various. He's made serious work and he makes chairs and candlesticks. It's fascinating. You know, um, I know that you're in the process of writing a, um, uh, a good bio critical biography on him now, an essay on him. And uh, we're going to be featuring that, so we'll alert people when when that's going to be ready. But we're really happy that you came to share your discovery with us today. And, well, uh, to, to, I mean, it is a widely known discovery, but but his work is not sufficiently in focus. I see. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully that will increasingly be corrected as we uh, 
as we go along on this on this journey and we're happy we're doing it with you thank you so much Peter. okay I'm, yeah i'm looking forward to this great thank you anthony for that those insights uh not very many people know that during this whole um uh, movement of graffiti in New York when the subways were being sprayed. And matter of fact, I remember riding the subway when I saw Keith Haring's uh, works all over uh, their interiors. Um, uh, during that time, uh, it was Linus Caraggio who put together this Rivington group, and it included Basquiat as well. And uh, of course, Basquiat and Haring went on to be famous, to be rock stars in the art world. And uh, Linus just kept doing his thing. He stands out because he's the one of the very, very few artists who is a sculptor doing three-dimensional uh, uh, graffiti. So you can walk around the East Village and see some uh, light posts, lamps, lamp posts, sign posts that have his uh, sculptures welded into them. And people just walk by and they're sort of surprised, what is this? Well, now you know, and uh, uh, Anthony is uh, writing about uh, Linus Caraggio, and um, he is, just did a wonderful job in explaining why he's significant and stands out, what he caught his eye. Well, um, Anthony, thank you so much for telling us about Linus. Um, this is definitely a new discovery for myself as well. Um, I definitely want to find out more. A three-dimensional graffiti artist is not something that I've particularly noticed around the streets of Manhattan myself, but I'm going to have to do some location scouting now, I think. Yes. Good. All right, so okay. Peter, I think there's a discovery that you want to start telling us about. Um, yes, I'd love to. You know, one of the more amazing experiences I had was uh, about six years ago when... Um, uh, a, 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 a wonderful older gentleman came into a gallery, which I was giving a talk, asked if he could speak with me afterwards. And he was very humble and uh, just s such a nice guy. I thought, well, sure, I'll, I'm always interested in looking and see. Well, I went and I visited him at his studio in Peck Slip uh, down the South Street Seaport area. At, walking to his studio was like walking into a a time capsule, 70 years worth of work that had been stored away very carefully. Harry Birchman is Swiss, um, and uh, he's in his 90s now. And um, I, was, I was just really surprised that everything should be so perfectly preserved, thousands and thousands of pieces. And it just didn't make sense. I couldn't figure out these are, this guy's brilliant. Why wasn't he discovered? So here's one of the reasons how artists get forgotten. Harry Birchman was classically designed commercial graphic packaging designer. Went to the Basel School of Fine Art. Uh, uh, mastered uh, the Swiss uh, design style the international style uh, during the fifth in, in by 1949 he graduated and he came to the united states he had a huge career you can walk into any cvs and see at least 20 different package designs from uh advil to bufferin to cool cigarettes those are in your mind you can imagine them now he designed them and it goes on and on and on so he never really had a need to go banging on gallery doors and uh, sort of subjugating himself to what is often a very uncomfortable process and demeaning process for artists that should never have to go through. Um, but uh, so that's his story. He truly was leading a double life. Uh, by day, he was doing his commercial design. And by night, he was painting like a maniac and just storing it all up. Well, that's a very familiar story. Um, that's a similar story to David Kastner, where David was working in a steel mill, creating work at night on the weekends. Then he went back to school. Then he went back to a factory. Then he went to graduate school. And um, supporting himself, supporting those who depend on him. And it sounds like um, Bertrand was doing the same thing exactly. uh, by day and by night. Exactly. And so I guess um, the most important question I have for you is when you first saw his work, um, what immediately struck you? Uh, what 
struck me right away was the, the, the authenticity of the work, the freshness of his vision. He wasn't derivative of anyone. And uh, that's the first thing that really struck me. You know, we, we look at art, we always make comparisons with what we already know, visiting museums, visiting galleries. And when you see something you really haven't seen before, it really hits you. And then you do more research and you want to know, well, why? So a lot of this is, um, in order to arrive at those aha moments, requires what a lot of people don't want to hear, and that's education. You got to educate your eyes. So that's one of the things they encourage everyone listening in to do. So that, and even the artists who are listening in, is your work really innovative or did somebody already do it and do it better? And you might be working in a similar style, but what are you doing to really stand out in an authentic way to make because it's really coming from your heart? But you don't always have to be the first, you can be the best at something. Exactly. Exactly. So Birchman, um, Harry, you know, one of the reasons I think um, it was a little difficult for him to get traction, he did have a gallery in Cleveland uh, when he was in Cleveland before he came to New York. And then he decided not to really pursue the galleries after that. But even if he had, uh, I think he would have found it a little bit difficult because he was uh, a jack of all trades and master of all. He did everything from uh, abstract expressionism uh, right during the same period when it was hot. And then when uh, photorealism, for example, came in, he was doing photorealism like uh, some of the, the leading people like Tom Wesselman was doing and uh, um, uh, he was, uh, then, he, then in 1962, he even was into uh, a whole series of paintings on minimalism that uh, have an op art sort of effect. So he really could do it. Hard Edge. Hard Edge came from California in 1959. It, it came uh, from LA to uh, New York. And he immediately looked at that and said, well, I can do that. And I can do that in a different way. And I can do it better. And so these are the things that that, that really stand out, and um, including collage. There's a lot of collage work they did. And Robert, you had an exhibition that included uh, some of his uh, collage pieces that uh, you still have that are, are really um, wonderful. That's um, correct. That's correct. Um, you curated a phenomenal show for me last year called It's Time to Stick Together, um, which yeah. was very well received um, um, in New York and across the country. Um, and it was very exciting. And Birchman, um, was definitely getting a little more tra um, traction than he was. And would you say it's these few moments over the past couple of years that's really changing the tide for him? I think so. Um, you know, we're in the process now of, of um, uh, creating a, a, a book on him, a 400 page uh, big coffee table type book that will accompany exhibitions. Um, and uh, we produced a 76 page catalog that's really a calling card to send to museums because it, it's a matter of making the effort to reach out and um, again, educate museum curators about an artist who they probably haven't heard of, but should. But should have, yes. And that's what is really exciting about everything that we're doing uh, with discoveries in American art. And you've been doing uh, with us, you know, Robert is, um, and on your own as a gallerist, uh, uh, introducing artists that we feel are really important. We don't want them to get lost in the cracks of our history. It's just not right because we know that most will. And uh, so we try, to, um, we try to save as many as we can for the benefit of our culture and of our society. Well, that's one thing that you and I bonded over immediately is that we were both trying to find the next greatest artist. And it didn't matter if that artist was eight or 80, um, race, creed, gender, sexual orientation. It was always trying to find, find that hidden gem. And exactly. it's, it's been that mutual mission um, that I've, we've been working on for the past 15 years now that we're trying to find that next artist, whether it's um, Harry Birchman or David Kastner, we're looking for those next greatest artists. So exactly. It's um, doing what we do uh, is a profession from which one does not retire. No. And uh, it's just to 
I, we're, we're both, I know, you know, voracious learners. We're still learning. And that's what keeps you going all the time. Making these discoveries is really exciting. So um, that's why we're happy to be here. And uh, again, appreciate being on Boston Design Week to introduce more people to what we've done. And I guess I'd say that um, one of the takeaways that we'd like everyone to have is to understand the value proposition um, uh, in, in a greater way uh, means being able to identify quality. And as far as uh, I'm concerned, quality is the, recognizing quality is that ability to spot uh, works that are, are truly innovative, uh, that stand out on the historical timeline uh, as being as being innovative, uh, apart from their predecessors, and they might, as we said before, be working in the same style, but they really added some punch to to make it their own, to really make it uh, unique. Um, and uh, so it, it it's that's what we're really we're really looking for. And and what's incredible is when you scratch beneath the surface you see this really fascinating life on, uh, on, on the artists who were forgotten or bypassed or marginalized uh, unfairly. And, um, you know, we're doing our best to bring back as many as we can. Well, it's very important to use the word quality as we discuss art. We discuss art from a collector standpoint, a gallerist standpoint, and it's also, Collectors need to know what they're what they're acquiring, what what where their money is going, what's on their wall. Um, having a great group of um, artists and critics today to show some some of the viewers that quality does mean different things to different people. Whether it's an artist, a critic, a gallerist, a historian, everyone has their own spin on it. But it's most importantly, you said before, Peter, is um, doing your research. That's the most important thing and really understanding the history, the context of what you're purchasing and ask questions. That way you get to learn more and don't be afraid to ask the dealer about, about the work itself, the physical qualities. When is this painting going to last? Is it constructed? What museums are it in? Um, what publications, what books have been published on this artist? These are all great questions and it'll help you make educated decisions whether you're investing for your, your, for your home, for an institution, um, anyone watching, it's learn more about what you're acquiring and looking at. Well said. Thank you, uh, everyone who's shown up. And if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, contact us. Um, uh, my email and Robert's email address uh, is shown here. And uh, we're happy to answer uh, any questions uh, that, that you might have and artists that you feel like exploring. And um, uh, so we look forward to that. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you so much, Tony and the team at Boston Design Week. And thank you so much for watching.